Um, yeah, I'm, I've decided to sit down. <laughs> it's not because I feel weak, but I feel in this informal environment, it's somehow nice to, to um, maybe also transition into the, um, into the Q&A afterwards. Um, so yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Andreas. Um, you now know where I, where I work and what I do. Maybe um, a little note on uh, what we do actually do at the Department uh, of Experimental Architecture at the University of Innsbruck in the unit for uh, building design and construction, which is a German uh, Hochbau. So actually traditional would be associated with um, buildings um, in the unit of uh, Professor Marian Coletti. And I show this slide not just to kind of promote the department and what we're doing, but also maybe as a bit of a preparation for what is to come and what one might anticipate uh, hearing a lecture from an architect or from an architecture school and what we're doing. What you see here are sort of, um, we work a lot with uh, digital fabrication and digital tools to design, to create shapes, to work with new materials, and including, and also robotic fabrication in the robotic lab, the Rex lab at the Technik campus here in Innsbruck. And the shapes you see here on the left are two installations we did for the Ars Electronica Festival in uh, Linz in 2021 and 2022. Um, and these are sort of materialized digital forms. The one in the middle, the, the Trope Spectre, even has an AR. A layer and a VR layer and we are working a lot with how to bring these digital tools into an experience, uh, for it to turn them into an experience in the material world. Um, and this doesn't necessarily always lead to shapes and forms or prototypes that are immediately recognizing, recognizable as parts of buildings. So this is where academic research and architecture might differ from what one might expect, especially at an architecture school especially the one in Innsbruck that has a very strong design focus. Now, I always like to bring this slide up, which is are these postcards from 1910, titled France in the year 2000, and it depicts the visionary future and how we might live in 100 years in the future. And what is interesting is it imagines an architect. The architect sits sheltered from the weather in this little hut that's fairly conventionally designed. And he's reading a written out plan and translating that written out, drawn, hand-drawn plan into a control module that is then wired to the machines that kind of emulate and you do the same processes as a manual laborer would do. So it is a form of optimization, a form of reduction of labor. But the building it is constructing in the back is fairly conventional. It is the normal thing that was built at the time. And now don't get me wrong, these are beautiful buildings. They're amazing. Everyone likes to live them and they also age really, really well. However, what we're looking at also at the department is what new forms, what new methods come from the use of digital tools and how they can be translated into proposals for buildings, usually done through prototypes and installations. Um, I've also in a, a correspondence with uh, Marian, uh, I have uh, decided to use this also as a small promotional uh, uh, opportunity. We're about to publish a free volume book that is the outcome of a uh, FWF PIG artistic research project. That is an amazing opportunity in Austria. There is this state funded project, uh, state funded funding line um, for artistic research, which is very convenient for architects since it liberates us slightly from the building application and allows to explore these before said other aspects. The project was led by Professor Marin Coletti. It is titled um, Post-Digital Neo-Baroque. Um, and it was this notion of post-digital is something that one might know from media studies and so forth, but it describes a period that comes after digitalization, after parts of digitalization have progressed and where we were investigating what these long, long processes of digital transformation architecture, how they how they manifest and return and what they bring back into the material world. Now to this talk, um, I have slightly adapted the subtitle of my thesis since uh, it is quite lengthy as we also discovered on Wednesday um, when, when, the, when the presentation, the Laudatius were held. So I shortened it and said design research on surrogate models for aging architecture, 
this trio of terms is also or this trio of duos of terms is also how I structured this thesis. Now, design research, maybe also since I think in the audience it's uh, mainly from other disciplines. Design research is on the one hand like what I'm doing, what we're doing. On the other hand, it's exactly not what I'm doing. It's actually something that comes from more or less the late 20th century where practitioners and designers were trying to structure and formalize research on design, trying to give it rigor and comparabilities to establish it as a form of research similar to scientific research or artistic research, which have much more established frameworks. However, in architecture, this term design research encompasses our mode of operation, which has a lot always to do with models, physical models, scale models, digital models, um, forms of prototyping, but these forms of prototyping are not prototyping as in design because no one builds a building one-to-one -to, -one to see how it works, optimize and builds it again. Like we don't prototype in the same way as others do, which is why also in architecture, digital tools and digital modeling have very early been adopted into the design profession because it allows to have this kind of yeah model uh, that you can explore in an almost one-to-one -one scale. Um, and a lot of the work you will see is also fairly, I would say, artistic. There's aesthetics play a role. I operate always on this um, on this uh, ornamental scale, um, not necessarily on a building scale. And this is me in the picture mainly for a lack of uh, lack of model during uh, COVID when this was created. Um, and you still need a person for scale reference in architecture always. Now. Um, at the end of my dissertation, I've been reflecting a lot on what this path, this design research means. And as any researcher um, knows, once you've done the research, it would be pretty easy to point straight at the direction to go to reach your goal. However, and here again, I also think in people in Innsbruck are fairly familiar. You still, when you go somewhere, you like the scenic route and you, and you go a long path and there's a certain satisfaction in going along this. So my research was a bit more like this long winding meandering ramp, uh, not the straight uh, road. There were a lot of uh, uh, distractions, a lot of where you get lost in these kind of design projects, um, a lot of uh, reflection and a lot of um, basically just working, working, working and um, thinking about the goal where you want to go. Um, Experimentation also means creating, in, for in, in architecture, it means a um, form of production. It means what I said before, what well, to, to work both digitally and physically. So on, and you, you accumulate over the research process a set of sort of these specimens and prototypes that are both a documentation of my research as well as a, a kind of a tool of communication. So it's always all these forms and shapes, all these, these photos of these kind of fragments. They're always generated digitally. They're fabricated digitally using 3D printers or CNC machines. Um, but they're always brought into the material world to assess them haptically and, and so on and so forth. And you kind of create through that almost like a chamber of curiosities, um, which is becomes your your data actually. So the data is often self-produced in this process, which might be very different to other disciplines. Um, uh, for this occasion, I was also asked to present uh, ongoing research. Uh, my, I finished my dissertation last year. I'm currently um, working on another project built on it, but I tried to figure out what are, for me, kind of research interests that I'm working on. One is the, as already said in the introduction, the aging of buildings, so figuring out how weathering and the environment manifests um, on, on buildings, external facades, how they change over time, how they not decay but change. Um, I'm, I'm interested, as I said before, in the ornamental scale, the rich history and theory of ornament and architecture, which was a big part of architecture until the 20th century and then kind of slowly declined in importance. Um, which is now resurfacing a lot through digital tools that allow us to create very intricate surfaces. So here again, digitalization having a big impact on a, on a very long discussion with architecture. Then production, as I mentioned before, the prototyping materials. And in the case of my thesis, it was smart materials. I will talk about this later, but materials that dynamically change according to environmental stimuli. And then on the right-hand side, it's the only digital image in this series. This is a rendering of also exploring these digital morphologies and shapes that come from using algorithms or procedural design. 
um, there's a lot of terminology for this, but basically working with the computer and working with software that leads to results that you usually would not have. Um, now, a small maybe excursion for everyone into the disciplinary context within architecture. This might be a bit small um, uh, for you to read, but it is for me, my research, also what I do in London, has a lot to do with ecological integration, so trying to integrate the environment into considerations in architecture. I see considering weathering and how buildings change in tandem with the environment as part of this ecological integration. And I've adapted two diagrams of two, uh, two um, uh, let's say, author, researchers of the 20, in the 20th century that I found very inspirational. On the left is one by Viktor Olgai, an Hungar Austro-Hungarian uh, researcher um, who published a book called Bioclimatic Design, um, which was in the mid 20th century a certain attempt to uh, turn environmental design and architecture into a science, actually. This was, this was new, and working with lab experiments. And I've extended these kind of um, factors influencing architectural expression, as he calls it, by the ecological limits besides the economical limits, the physical needs, and the emotional needs of what defines a building facade. And then on the right-hand side is a concept also from Stuart Brand, who is has been um, very influential in the ecological movement in the United States and the hippie culture. And he kind of formulated this concept of shearing layers, which are a building conceived of different layers of longevity, the site, so the city being the permanent down to the furniture and the things we see in here that change regularly, whoever occupies it. And here again, also the ecological consideration would be an addition that is quite key at least in my understanding, to our current time. So this is a little excursion to what, what is the theoretical field I'm operating in. Now, talking about different layers of longevity, as in the right diagram, brings me to the second part of this tree, the aging architecture, the framework dealing with what happens with buildings after they are built. Now, what you see here is a, is a redrawn graph of the result of, of research uh, published last year which was a very large global study using uh, machine learning actually to see through large amounts of data on the predicted lifespan of buildings globally. And you, at the bottom we see a, uh, at the X axis we see a timeline from 1900 till 2009, and then the Y axis we see the lifespan of buildings from 50 to 450 years. And we see that actually, um, we are currently on a trajectory that buildings are built for shorter and shorter lifespans globally. So we're building, so from a sustainability perspective, we all talk we should refurbish and retrofit and reuse buildings, not build anything new, lower resources. Actually, globally, we're building buildings that have shorter predicted lifespans. Now, this is many, many, many reasons, of course, socioeconomic, how construction industry works, how development and the financial sector works. But it still kind of it was for me an interesting point that what I'm looking at was most likely old buildings and what, what new is actually coming. A second diagram is, is, is key, and then I'm done with these diagrams, um, is one that shows the involvement of the designer, in that case the architect in a project usually, the sharp demarcation line where the involvement declines is when the building is being constructed. So the, the architect has still a role when it's constructed, a managerial, organizational, controlling role, but no longer a, a, a one that actually ha is involved in what, how the building changes. And there comes, starts this sort of afterlife of a building. And this is a disciplinary problem we have, that in architecture, we often do not consider a lot what happens afterwards. We are fine with avoiding that it decays for this specific lifetime. This is what we do. We do not say, let's say, orchestrate or design actually specifically what happens to these surfaces. Now, every research, um, at least in, in, in architecture, requires some form of historic precedent. I found a very lucky one that was, uh, or I was lucky to find something that was covering all my fields of interest. And that was an issue of um, another environmental crisis, but not the current one, the global one, a more local one in 19th century at Great Britain, where industrialization was in full go. There was um, massive air pollution from the coal-fired fa factories. And this air pollution was so that the buildings that were 
supposed to be permanent, so all the limestone and sandstone buildings were so susceptible to weathering that they were crumbling while being constructed. And this led to a huge problem within this little thought cluster of architecture. Um, how do you avoid this? And then when the, when the, the fancy gentlemen uh, of the Victorian age and ladies went on their grand tour to around Europe, they would go to less polluted areas and they would see the weathering like in Venice being beautiful and full of growth because simply there wasn't the same form of the city plain. So, and so this, this mix of international outlook, a change in the environment, led to technological advancements. So this is pre-digital, of course, but it led to people using on facades materials that are more durable. For example, double-fired brick that is impervious, it does not decay, or looking back at more historic examples like this, I guess many of you have been to Florence, the Duomo, which is clad in different marbles, that is a very resistant materials. This led to a discussion that's called uh, architectural polychromy discussions, so multicolored architecture, which now we're in the building, I think in your description, to, how to get here, you say the blue clad building, sort of like this idea of having multiple colors on an external facade was an absolute no-go in the 19th century. This was, you would not, it would be monochrome on the outside. So actually through these new materials that were used in response to environmental change, um, the entire appearance of buildings was, uh, um, subsequently um, kind of altered. And then uh, the third image we see uh, like something that I studied a lot, sort of Gothic ornament that uh, is very geometrically uh, intricate, a lot of surface area, a lot of it is happening. And we see also this kind of surf this variegation, sort of different types of color in it. And on the right hand side, this is the final historic example that I, uh, that I changed to the, to the digital part, um, is the Majolica house by Otto Wagner in Vienna in the Naschmarkt, um, which is clad in these uh, colorful ceramic tiles with these um, beautiful um, Art Nouveau um, pattern, um, patterns and colors. And here it was actually the intention of the architect to design a building that could be washed and hosed down and would clean itself. So here again, the use of ceramic, funnily, right next to it is a building built two years later that doesn't do this by the same architect. But <laughs> here at least it was sort of like where the introduction of color, use of ceramics as an advanced material back then um, as a response to the decay of buildings and this idea that was really coming with modernism of the permanence of a finished design that stays the same. Good. Uh, this was a little introduction I felt was maybe needed to uh, to understand a bit where I'm coming from. Um, the, the, now this is the title, subtitle of the dissertation, Exploring Thermochromic Materials as Surrogate Models for Design Integration of Surface Weathering in Architecture. Um, it was supervised by Professor Maren Coletti at the department. I've done it between 2018 and 2023. Um, some of you have met uh, Professor Dagmar Reinhardt from the University of Sydney who helped the Laudatio and Marian. Uh, place on Wednesday. She was the reviewer of the uh, external reviewer, one of the external reviewers, and then we had uh, Professor Anne Stiefel at the uh, Rigorosum as an external examiner. You, this is only half an hour lecture. I hope I remain in time, um, but you can. You're all welcome to see the, the to check out the dissertation. It's in the University of Innsbruck repository. The PDF can be downloaded from the website, and um, since this is recorded, I also added these. QR codes and the links in all the slides so one could go back. Which brings me to the, the last part, the third part of my presentation, the, the my understanding, my use of surrogate models. As I understand, I'm pretty sure in the digital sciences you're quite familiar with surrogate models in forms of simulation and uh, mathematical models. In my case, the surrogate models were actually material surrogate models, so using the architect's models in order to anticipate weathering of surfaces and then compare this with digital simulations that are more known um, in order to get a very accessible uh, approach that is with, fits within the architect's framework of operation. And these are always approximation methods, of course. So therefore, I sacrificed, um, so let's say, accuracy for accessibility. Um, so in detail, I've shown some of these facades from further away before. I've been analyzing a lot of these sort of uh, states of uh, weathering in these um, 
usually um, stereotomic, so stone, cut stone, uh, and masonry structures and ornaments, and which was handy. I did a lot of it in Vienna and in Budapest. In Vienna is the problem, there was a lot of money, so everything is refurbished and looks like it was built at the same time. Budapest, there was much less money, so you find these buildings in all various forms of decay, um, but they are from the same period. And one would find then, if, if, a, if a stone uh, structure is exposed to weather, you will find very particular patterns and discolorations that are always reflecting the geometry and the orientation. Now, one could create a digital surrogate model, uh, re make a 3D scan of such a structure, remodel and make a digital model, and then expose that to various environmental conditions in a digital environment. This is what we do, what architects do, what the building engineers do. Uh, it's, it's fairly common practice. However, and this was something that I discovered when teaching also students these things, it is still uh, almost like something that is, ex it's an external tool. You need to work in your environment and you take it out, you feed it into software, you bring it back. And this kind of like um, empathic uh, engagement with such, such a thing is for architects quite important. So I've been looking at how could I do this without, how could I do what I can do digitally? How can I do this uh, with materials? And this is a close-up of one of these kind of prototypes. It's a model that's around 30 by 30 centimeters. It is a 3D printed uh, clay object that was fired. And when you see here these kind of beige colors, this is the natural color of the clay. Then I've, this was part of the method you will see later. I will add, I added these kind of dots to get more contrast and a bit of color into it at specific locations. And then what you see as black is uh, this thermochromic ink that is an ink that changes color with temperature. So it's a coating that when it above seven, 27 degrees, it goes from black to white to transparent, slowly revealing what is underneath. And this is of course, depending on the direction of where the heat is coming from, the specific heat capacity of the material um, uh, and, um, and the duration of exposure. And therefore one can find relationships between um, the sort of the, the change of color and the orientation of where this comes from. And I use this to sort of simulate rain wash discoloration. So what would happen if water runs over something for a very long time? Um, then this is of course a digitally generated shape. There's always a digital twin in the design environment. Um, there is then the digital fabrication for 3D printing into a physical object. And then there comes evaluation using like photography, 3D scanning, but also graphic imaging. And all of this in order to evaluate whether these changes are comparable to what would happen uh, to the virtual design environment. And then um, you know, as architects, we often work with design projects. So one um, tries different shapes, different kind of methods. And I've done four, I think five that are documented in the thesis. All of those projects and the entire workflow uh, consists of a, a variety of digital tools that are often used as a user, not necessarily as someone who develops these tools. I'm not a, not a, not a programmer, I don't write the code, I'm a, a user and an applier of it. What I do is I find methods how I can make this work for myself. And they go everything from procedural design, some use of AI where I try to actually train an AI to make these predictions for me. I also did that with students quite successfully in London. And then trying to use these color changing patterns for as markers for AR applications um, to then the fabrication techniques which are 3D printing and CNC milling and so forth. We again use digital tools to uh, turn this into a materiality. I will not go into each of these projects um, since that would really be beyond the scope of the of the lecture. But I will show one video now that is from an early from one of the earliest projects. It's around four minutes. Then I will stop, and uh, it kind of explains the the process in in in, in all.
yeah, so the video goes on, but um, it goes on a bit longer and it becomes a bit repetitive, I think. <laughs> but um, so this is also four years old. But if someone wants to see the whole one, it's on YouTube. Um, you can see. So this um, kind of brings me a bit to the to the end of the of the presentation of these um, three aspects of my work. Um, and I hope there's going to be questions. Um, I assume there's questions, maybe some the same from Wednesday and maybe some new ones. But um, uh, yeah, I'm, thank you for your attention. <laughs>